just been discussing right now because I'm uh, delighted to be joined by the International Trade Secretary, a true believer in Brexit, Liam Fox. Very good to see you. Hi, Thanks for coming in today. Um, I'd quite like to sort of kick off with something slap bang in the middle of your duties, which is the issue of if the Prime Minister manages to negotiate this transition deal that she wants, what will that mean for your ability to negotiate trade deals with the likes of, likes of America? Are you clear that you will be able to kick off those negotiations formally in detail at that point. Yes, that's one of the things that we will be wanting to get an assurance about. Is it a red line? Is, is that absolutely vital, as it were, in terms of... Well, think about, think about the converse. If we weren't able to do that, that yeah. would mean that we would ultimately be leaving the European Union having spent potentially a transition period, an implementation period of two years, without having to make the preparations necessary. That would not be in our national interest. I mean, the rest of the EU are saying at the moment that if we want the status quo in terms of in that transition period continued membership of the customs union continued membership of the single market all the current rules have to apply and that means you couldn't negotiate well what any implementation period would contain will be part of the negotiation itself and so we couldn't accept being told that we couldn't do certain things that were clearly in our interests and that we were in a very different dynamic. We would already technically have left the European Union. We might be voluntarily agreeing certain things to provide better certainty for our businesses, but we would have to do what we thought was necessary in the UK's national interest. I think if you look at the way that the European Union... If you look at the way the European yeah. Union have already dealt with the United Kingdom on this issue, what's called sincere cooperation, yeah. there's been a great deal of flexibility on that. I've met with the EU Commissioner. Um, we're very open and transparent about what we're doing. So I think that spirit of cooperation would continue. No, no, I, obviously, I understand that from your point of view, you've got to be optimistic, but, can I, but I do just want to pin you down on this. As far as you're concerned, if they don't give you the right to do those negotiations on third-party trade deals, we shouldn't have a transition or implementation period. We I should go for a clean break, a no-deal break. I don't think it would be possible for us to agree that, nor do I think that they actually would agree that. Right. Because you say I'm being optimistic. Actually, the arrangements that we're having at the present time, for example, our scoping agreements with the United States, we're very open with the Commission about that. They've not raised any objections to that. Uh, away from uh, the sort of hyperbole around mm. the divorce bill, there's actually a great deal of cooperation going on between us. Can I just ask, in terms of the talks that you're currently having, because you jet around the world seeing governments about trade all the time, what is it you're actually allowed to do at the moment? Well, most of what we do as a department is about trade and investment. It's about promoting British exports, which we've seen rise by 13.1% in the past year. It's so also it's about, about promoting exports within, the, exports within the current framework? It's about trade. Okay. okay. And let's separate out two things. One is trade what yeah. the UK sells and the investments that we have from trade policy, yeah, yeah. which is our ability to negotiate new or renegotiate existing yeah. trade so, agreements. So the latter you can't do. So you can't do the, re the renegotiating of trade deals, but you're pretty well occupied, you feel, simply waving the flag for British companies at the moment. Well, we've got two things to do before we leave the European Union. One is we have to continue to push our trade, because whether we stayed in the European Union or not, the UK is not exporting enough. Uh, we don't have a big enough share of global markets. It's getting better, but it's not yet good enough. As a country, we are exporting less of our GDP than most other countries in Europe. That has to improve, whether we stay in the EU or not. Um, but we also have to ensure that for the legal process of leaving the European Union, we're able to do things like making sure that the EU's trade agreements with third countries are replicated for the UK so that there's no crashing out, there's no disruption of trade at the point that we leave the European Union. Now, the French president said that there is still a big gap between Britain and the rest of the EU on how much we should pay as a divorce bill. What do you think the final number, the final amount we'll pay that will satisfy them will turn out to be? I don't know what that, that number is, but it's very clear that we could only have that final number as part of a final agreement. We will want to know what the end state is. We want to know that. Europe, European businesses want to know what, that. And you, investors. I'm not sure people out there know exactly what you mean by an end state. What will our trading agreement with Europe be? 
because clearly the United Kingdom um, will want to know what freedom we will have to trade. So, so just to Europe. be clear, because again, th there has been a bit of ambiguity from some of your colleagues about this, your very clear view is we cannot agree the final number unless we've also got agreement on the core principles of a trade deal with the rest of the EU? I don't think there's any ambiguity. The Prime Minister has said this. We can't come to a final figure until we know what the final package looks so like. That will, so, so we won't know that till, well, very close, presumably, to March 29, so March 30, 2019. But the Prime Minister has been very clear that in the current budgetary cycle, none of our European partners should fear either that they will be given less money or they will have to pay more. That's a very generous position for the UK to take, considering that they, we're actually but leaving. Say, but they say that means we have to pay something like 50 to 60 billion euros. Are we countenancing 50 to 60 billion well, euros? Well, we're going, as David Davis has made very clear, we're going through line by line exactly what it is the European Union say that they want. Uh, and when we've done that, then we will conclude that negotiation as part of the, the broader package. But it does sound the to idea... me that you're opening the door to us paying something as, as substantial as that. I think you could draw any conclusion you like from what I'm saying, and I'm saying that what we will decide is a number when we can see the final package. I've made this, this as has David Davis in uh, discussions we've had with ministers across the European Union. We've made very clear our position. And when we said to them, would you simply give a number before you knew what the outcome was going to be, they say, absolutely not. In which case we say, so why should we? So what will we know by the end of the year which will allow us to move on to trade talks? What, what, what it needs to actually be agreed by then? Well, I think that, that we have to give the European Union further assurance that we're moving in the right direction. I think that the summit this week was really quite instructive in that, and I think that the tone was very different coming out of the, uh, the summit, that they accept that the United Kingdom is very serious, that the Prime Minister is very sincere about wanting to come to an agreement. But of course we then have to decide what is the trading relationship that we want in Europe, which for most people around the world is the big question. So for investors, I was in Tokyo a few weeks ago and they were saying this is not just about our investments in the United Kingdom, it's our investments in Italy and Spain mm. and Germany and what access they will have to the UK market. And they're looking for as open a relationship as we have today. That is what they want to see. That of course is what we want to see. And just to be clear on your current position on this, some of your colleagues from the Brexit campaign actually think that a no-deal Brexit would be better than the kind of deals they think might be on offer. What's your current position about how worried we should be about a no-deal Brexit, should it come to that? Well, if we have no deal, and we trade on current WTO terms. Yep. Uh, that's the basis that not only that Britain trades with countries like the United States, but that the EU trades with the rest of the world in most circumstances. So it's not exactly a nightmare scenario. But so it you're, is not not you're not scared of that eventually? I am not scared of that, but I would prefer to have a deal yeah. because it would give greater certainty and almost certainly greater, would greater, it give greater certainty? openness of trade. The WTO rules are quite clear. Why would it give greater certainty? Because if we've got a, a, a more liberal uh, agreement that doesn't, for example, include tariffs, it's easier, it's more certain for UK businesses, that's what we want to see. And we've been uh, saying to our European colleagues uh, at every level that we can we are absolutely determined to get to that deal and if you think about it Robert if in a normal trade agreement mm. you and I would be some distance apart we would negotiate that difference down to the mm. smallest amount possible mm. that's not where we are in the European Union we're beginning from complete identity we have no tariffs we have complete regulatory equivalence uh, and therefore all that can happen is we either stay the same or we get slightly further apart for political reasons. We want us to maintain that closeness because the global economy has not been doing tremendously well and then trade's not been doing tremendously well globally. So we can't really afford to put any impediments to trade and investment in Europe that don't exist today. So, so uh, one very brief question. We'll come back to you obviously after the break, but we've, we've got a break coming. Um, your officials have done impact studies based on different scenarios. What do they say about the economic consequences of a no-deal Brexit? That depends what you put in place in terms of mitigation. And, of course, we've looked at a whole range of potential options. Uh, but there are reports that your officials say that a no-deal Brexit would be very damaging economically for the UK. We would look, if we had no deal, 
to see what the costs may be and how we might mitigate them for a number of our industries. Yeah. We might have particular problems, for example, with tariffs, and we have a range of options yeah. that we could put in place. Will you publish those impact studies? There's a lot of pressure on you to do that. Well, you know, what, why would we publish data in a negotiation that might actually diminish our negotiating hand? Uh, we're clearly going to want to argue for a full, open, comprehensive agreement with Europe, but we'll prepare for the United Kingdom's national interest being defended if we can't get one. But just to be absolutely clear, the position of Macron that this is just a bluff, we're, that, that, that we're not serious about a no-deal Brexit, he's completely wrong about that? Completely wrong about that. Thank you. So, we'll be back with more from Liam Fox in a couple of minutes after the break. Welcome back to Preston on Sunday. Liam Fox asked for a clean, hard exit, but we just said no, so he's still here, thank goodness. First Allegra. Right, OK, so the comedian David Schneider has sent this tweet. He has asked, does Liam Fox still believe that the Brexit negotiations will be the easiest in human history? You did, he just nodded, so we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but then... Uh, in the interview earlier, Liam Fox talked about not being scared of no deal. This is very interesting from the editor of The Spectator. He is pointing to an opinion, Pinium Observer poll this morning, showing that of all the Brexit scenarios, no deal is the one that's preferred by the British people. But look, these negotiations look incredibly lonely, don't they? If you were in any doubt, uh, Downing Street let this photo be taken of her at the EU negotiations this week. Now, of course, later she would be joined by EU leaders, um, and she is supposed to have told them this. Give me a deal I can sell to the British public. But did she really mean the following two factions? You have, importantly, the Cabinet Committee, of which Liam Fox is a member. I think you guys are going to have to sign off any deal she goes for. And then, of course, you have um, Brexit backbenchers, most famously Jacob Rees-Mogg. So, yes, it is the public, but Liam Fox, it's really you she needs to please, isn't it? Well, I'm delighted that Liam Fox is still with me. I'd just like to pick up uh, on that point. Do you regret saying that you thought a trade deal would be the easiest deal in history? No, I don't. And what I, the point I was making was that it's unique. Because, as I said, in most trade deals, you're trying to, to reduce a distance. But in the European Union trading agreement, we are already at the point where we have no tariffs and we have complete regulatory equivalents. That has never happened. But why does Angela Merkel before. say, as she did just a couple of days ago, that the talks on trade and the future relationship are going to be way more complicated than even these amazingly complicated negotiations we're going through now? Well, they're not... Is she, is she just wrong about that? I do think they're difficult in terms of the trade law or the trade negotiations themselves. The difficulty is the politics. Yeah. In other words, how much does the European Commission and the European elite want to punish Britain? for having the audacity to use our legal rights to leave the European Union. That, that's the thing. And, and how, what will the price be for the prosperity of European citizens of that decision? Now, I would hope that economic sense would dictate that we put the prosperity agenda mm. of the whole of the European continent in a global context at the top of that agenda, not ever closer union. In other words, the drive by the Commission towards their political objective, which has a near theological level. Now, you will have to sell any deal that you get to the broad church that is the Tory party, a particular wide series of views on Brexit itself. Do you think your party made a mistake in choosing a Remainer rather than a Brexiteer like yourself to be Prime Minister and therefore lead these negotiations? I do think the party took a primary view on whether it was a Remainer or a Lever. I think they chose who they thought was the best candidate for Prime Minister. And I think the Prime Minister's approach to Europe, the way she set out in her Lancaster but do you trust, house speech... do you trust her I to do. adhere to the principles that you think are important? I do, very much so. Um, and and why, why do you feel that, given that, for example, she was not prepared to say only recently, whether she'd been converted to the Brexit cause. Well, what she was asked was, what would she vote in another referendum? And she made very clear, which I reiterate, there will not be another referendum uh, on whether we leave the yeah, European Union Yeah, but you know how you would vote in the theoretical circumstances of another referendum, don't you? Well, there's not going to be another referendum, and so we don't need to get into that question. Uh, everyone knows you're what telling my me you're converted was. to the Remain cause, I, I think, I think, I think there are conversions that are more likely, <laughs> Robert, frankly, than, than that one. But can I just ask you, since, you know, you and I have talked a lot about the economic consequences of Brexit over a long period of time, before that EU referendum vote, the British economy was growing faster than the other big economies in Europe. We're now growing considerably slower than the other big economies in Europe. Why do you think that is? Well, we're not growing 
faster than um, than the majority of the economies in Europe. No, uh, slower. We're, slower. We are, and, we are and, growing and slower and than, if you the look big, at, than our major competitors in Europe. We if, are, I mean, if you can't look deny at, that. You, so why is well, that? Well, if you look and if you look at some of the projections, we've got quite a range of projections of growth ahead, and the Chancellor will set those out in the budget ahead. But all the, as you know, mainstream projections and the Chancellor will also, I'm afraid, sign up to this because this is where economists are, will, will show that we are growing slower than our major competitors. Well, we have grown much faster than them. There's a degree of catching up there. If you look at you know, the fact that we have had uh, record levels of employment in the UK, very different from most of our European competitors, it'd be surprising so if they nothing, weren't catching nothing up Nothing to do with falling business confidence because of Brexit, nothing to do with a falling pound that is, again, related to the referendum, that well, is squeezing living standards? Well, let, let, let's take the question of confidence. Last year, in the first full year after the referendum, we had more foreign direct investment into the United Kingdom than any year in our history. That is a vote of confidence from international investors. Except that you, the Office of National Statistics implies that that is uh, basically the delayed result of previous pre-referendum decisions. No, a lot of that were, was new decisions coming in, and I can tell you that from our information that we have so far this year, that we're actually keeping up with last year's record levels of investment. This, you know, this country has very strong yeah. fundamentals. When I say to people, why choose Britain, they say, your legal system, skilled workforce, low regulation, low taxation, cutting edge research, you speak English, you're in the right trading zone uh, globally, not one of those requires our membership of the European Union. Now, we're almost out of time. Two very quick questions. One is, you know Spain well, spent a lot of time there. How worried are you by events in Catalonia? I'm more sad than, than, than worried. Um, I think it's a great shame that we're, we're, we're getting the levels of protest and violence that we've seen. The Spanish government clearly has a right to maintain its constitution and uphold the rule of law, but I would have hoped that any democratic future of Catalonia would be decided by the people in a peaceful way. Now, again, very briefly, we always ask our viewers a question, uh, and we've got one from Michael Andrews, uh, uh, who nods to a little statement that the Prime Minister made recently, saying that she wanted to be stuck on a desert island with you. So, uh, ruling out your wife, um, who do you want to be stuck on a desert island with? Um, I think in terms...